<laughs> so with with lockdown continuing around most of the world, um, Crave's not able to cover a whole lot in the way of live entertainment, and so we're reading a lot of books lately. And so this morning we're talking to Scottish author John Niven uh, about his latest novel. Now, John, you've got to tell me, how are we pronouncing the name of this book? <laughs> well, uh, it varies depending on the media outlet that you're, you're, you're on. Um, well, we're grown-ups. Uh, okay, well, then the fuck it list should be acceptable. Aye, right, fair but, enough, yeah. then. On TV and radio uh, during the during the promotion, it's often been the effort list, the right. rhymes with bucket list, the, you know, <laughs> with various euphemisms. Yes. So, 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 so tell us about the fuck it list. What exactly are we fucking here? <laughs> well, the, I, you know, the, the, the title's very obviously a sort of play on the concept of a, a bucket list. Right. And the, the central character, Frank Brill, uh, is told he has terminal cancer. He's 60. And rather than doing the bucket list thing of going and swimming with dolphins or climbing the Himalayas or that kind of thing, Frank has a bucket list of people he's going to kill. Right. Uh, some of which are personal reasons and some of which are political. Which we And we discover the reasons as we go through the book. And the, the political sort of becomes the personal at various mm. points, um, as we learn what's impacted in his life. Uh, the book's it's set um, against the backdrop of America in 2026. So it's the near future, it's six years from now. And the assumption is that Trump has won two terms in office and that we're now halfway through Ivanka's first term in office. So it's kind of America after a decade of Trumpism as the backstop, to the backdrop to the book. Uh, it kind of the, the notion of the actual book. I, I've got a friend of mine back in Ayrshire in Scotland, Alan, Alan Crothers, who's one of these guys. He's very funny. He um, he thinks he's completely sane and normal while actually being insanely eccentric. And we're okay. in the pub. We're in the pub one night about seven or eight years ago, and it was Alan who said we just heard about a friend of ours who'd got cancer diagnosis, and Alan said, oh, you know what you do if that happens to you, John?" And we're going, you know. Swim with the dolphins going yeah. play, you know, that's yeah. and he went, No, 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 you've got a list of five or six cunts that have really fucked you over in your life, you know. <laughs> and you, you turn up at the door and ring, ding, ding, you ring the bell. You get a shotgun, right? And they open the door and you give them a second, they fucking know, they know why you're there. And then, yeah, you blow them. We're all just looking at them going, You're going a killing spree. And he's like, Aye, would you, would you not do that? So I just thought this was hilarious that that would be his response to, to getting right. cancer. And But as I say, this was seven or eight years ago, and sometimes you just file these things away. And um, Nabokov said that writing a novel is it begins with a tiny throb that you think, here's an idea I could write a novel about. Yeah. And then in my experience, that throb becomes a recurring thought that finally becomes the only possible thought you think this is this is a book. And yeah. One idea is really enough. You're normally two or three ideas that kind of come together, and I'd also, just in the last three years or so, been increasingly looking at writing a book set in a, a near future imagining of Trump's America. So those two ideas: the guy getting cancer and going on the road on a killing spree, and setting it in 2026. That became the sort of essence of the book. Ah, oh, fair enough. That now I know your your, your animosity toward. Um the, the Trump family as a whole is fairly well documented on your Twitter feed, mm. uh, which I, I suspect possibly has something to do with the ownership of, of Turnberry and his, his, um, <laughs> well, his yeah, desecration that... of, the, of the good game of golf. Yeah, that's um, a great day for me, you know. Uh, no, I, I can that, imagine. I love, I love that course, and of course I can't go back there. No, you know, you can't, I, can you? And also Dunbeg in Ireland. We have a holiday home in County Clare. Um, oh dear! And it's just like um, it's 15, 20 minutes from Trump's, what's now Trump doing big. And again, that was a beautiful golf course that I love playing, and I can't go there either. So it's, yeah, he's happened to buy two courses, both within sort of 15, 20 minutes of where I have homes. It's, it's very depressing. <laughs> so it's almost personal, isn't it? Yeah, well, <laughs> well, it was personal for a while, and that Trump blocked me on Twitter uh, eight, eight years ago. Yeah, eight years oh, ago. Wow. Yeah, before he was president, he blocked me. Um, I I, can, I was living in Los Angeles for a while in 2012, mm -hmm. um, uh, for about six months. When Obama won his... I, I kind of started noticing on Twitter that Trump was obsessed with Obama. 
Yes. Back, he was constantly tweeting about Obama, and I kind of got into I, I kind of get into enjoying it. You know, this he's clearly this mental dwarf trying to take on Obama, and I, right. I kind of enjoyed the comedy of it. And then um, it was the night Obama won his second term. Uh, oh yeah, and Trump tweeted. It was clearly Trump was in a foul, foul mood about this. I never thought for a minute it was going to happen. He was convinced Obama was going to lose. Yeah. And uh, Trump tweeted, bah, back to the drawing board. <laughs> and I remember I tweeted him saying, you sound like a, a really shit Scooby-Doo villain. Oh, fucking. dear. And, uh, and I think that was the breaking point. He bl- you're blocked by Donald Trump. So well, it kind of felt like an achievement. Well, I kind of felt like I'd skin in the game before most of us did, you know? Yeah. And off the back of this, I kind of watched his political rise from very early on. And as I say, I spent a lot of time in LA and have a lot of friends here who are Democrats, obviously, and work in the entertainment industry. And I said to them very early days, do you think, you know, I think he's going to run for the nomination? And they said, don't be crazy now. He's just trying to enhance his brand, what have you. And then as things developed, sure enough, he did run. Um, and I said to them, do you think he could win? And they went, don't be stupid. There's just a, mm-hmm. here's the way it works, and this can happen, and that can happen. Yeah. There's no way, it's not possible. It's the next thing, he wins the nomination. So at that point, the question was, do you think he win the election? Every, every, no, ab, no, it's not, there's no chance in hell he's going to flame out. He's going to, at that point, I thought, you know what? Everybody's been wrong about every step of this so far. So mm-hmm. at that point, I went and we put quite a lot of money on um, bets. On, on, I, I put quite a bit of money that Trump would win the election. Did you by any chance happen to remember the odds you got? Uh, yep, yeah, yeah, because we had to put about, nobody would take a bet of much more than 150 quid. So we had to put okay. four different bets on, and the odds varied from 10 to 1 to, I think, 12 or 13 to 1. Oh, which, well played. Yeah, so we won a fair chunk. Um, in fact, I was actually in LA on the night of the election. I watched the, the Trump's election victory in, in LA. Um, it started at Soho House, and it was all looking good there early mm-hmm. early doors and then we went back to somebody's house for a party and then just gradually as the evening progressed and the reality started to dawn mm-hmm. it turned into a week as it did for many people and <laughs> I think I drank an entire bottle of scotch that night and was in in a bit of a state the money yeah. the money was comforting but not that comforting <laughs> but what funnily enough actually because um I was more I was kind of convinced he was going to win but right you know praying that it wouldn't and yeah. I, you know, people who are sports nuts do this, don't they? They place bets against their own team, you know, in yeah. sporting contests. Um, and I, but I rang Charlotte, my partner, back in London the day before and said, Let's go and see if you can get another 100 quid on somewhere because I've got a feeling this is going to happen. Right. And right. Uh, she's in the betting shop putting it on, and the girl says to her, uh, the, and this is in London, you know, and the girl in the yeah, betting yeah. shop says, oh, oh, Trump, did you like him? And she went, no, not really. <laughs> and she went, oh, yeah, I do. I thought, yeah, he speaks his mind, doesn't he? And yeah. at that point, oh, my God, if some idiot in a betting shop in London thinks that, what are they thinking in the heartland, you know? Oh, oh, oh yeah. And, and, and so sure enough, um, it came to pass. And what we did actually was we, we took a few hundred quid of the winnings and rolled it. The same day we picked the winnings up after the election, yeah. we, we rolled it onto an impeachment bet. Oh dear! Yeah, then the odds at that point for impeachment were well, not outlandish, but again, ten to one sort of territory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And after being in office eighteen months, we were down to evens, you know. And <laughs> sure, sure enough, we won the impeachment bet in January too. Um, we had to do a bit, a bit of arguing with the bookies, but they finally all paid out. But mm-hmm. friends were saying to me, "How did you know? How did you get that both right?" And I said, "Well, the election was a bit of a roll of the dice, but yeah, yeah. the impeachment bet was a lock." You could take it was that. Only a matter of time, really, wasn't it? The day he won, I put that bet on. It was a lot. Yeah. Because, you know, criminals going to crime. It's just no way he can. He's a crime machine. You yeah. Know, it, was, it. it was more a question of of when and how, really, than rather than if, yeah. The weather. So, so, so actually, trying to tie this back to um to, to, to the, the book that we're supposed to be discussing here, <laughs> right? Um, so, so without getting into too much spoilers, obviously, we're talking about uh, a second term. So, you see that coming, don't you? Ah, I kind of do at the moment, I'm afraid, because for one overriding reason, I think he's going to cheat. Um, okay. They're going to ballot harvest, they're going to gerrymander, they're going to have a lot of Russian help again uh, yep. on social media. Facebook, Zuckerberg's firmly planted his flag behind Trump. Um, 
it's going to be very difficult, I think, for the Democrats to win. Um, I can see a couple of scenarios where if it's very close, and let's face it, US elections are usually close. True, true. If, it, if it's very close, he'll refuse to accept the result. Yes. If, if for some reason there is this huge, um, you know, um, red wave and the blue wave rather than the you know, the Democrats have a landslide, I think he'll refuse to accept the result. He'll insist it must be fraudulent because it's of such course. a huge. Mar- you know, I can't see a scenario he accepts it. You know, and a lot of people who have known him through his life will say he just there's no way he peacefully surrenders power. And when I was when I was researching the novel, when I was sort of imagining future scenarios. I thought a very plausible one, and this might yet play out, will be that he wins. He wins in November, and yeah. he will do two or three years of his second ter- term. And mm. at that point, he'll install, he'll fire Mike Pence, and install Ivanka as, right. as as vice president, which is perfectly within his rights to do. Um, and at that point, by the time Ivanka comes to fight the twenty twenty four election. She'd have had, you know, 18 months or two years, whatever experience as a VP. And, you know, or, or, or he could, in fact, the darker route is appoint her as vice president and then he resigns the office due to ill yes. health. So she gets to become acting president for, you know, a year or so before she has to fight an election. Um, so that, that was a kind of scenario that I, I worked with in mind when I was writing the book. That's kind of what right. happens in the novel. Um and I think at that point, I, I don't know if you've read Sarah Kensdor's book, um, Hiding in Plain Sight. She, no, no. Um, she's an American academic who spent her professional life studying autocracies in, a, in the former Soviet Union. And she makes the point that once autocrats get in, it's incredibly difficult to get them out. Right. Because, that you know... Sense. And you see this with the media and the Democrat Party. We're, they're all still playing with the old rules. They're all still playing in the old world, where yeah. you know they're bringing a knife to a nuke fight. <laughs> you're, you're, you're fighting people who will literally. I mean, you know, um, the president's son, Don Jr., who I think is probably arguably the most loathsome of all the Trumps, literally called Joe, accused Joe Biden to be the paedophile. Yes. On Twitter, the end doesn't seem to really have been any comeback for that. Seems to be, yep, yeah, that's all right, fair enough. Or, it, or indeed, are an appreciation of the irony of it. Well, exactly. <laughs> so yeah. I, 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 we're in crazy territory. And I, I, you know, I, what would I admit, uh, you know, I've answered this question a couple of times in the interviews, and it's quite quite an extreme backdrop to the to the novel, yeah. the fuck it list. But I, 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 two things. One, I think I, I don't, I'm constantly thinking that I didn't go far enough because c- current events keep outstripping what I'd imagined. Yeah. Um, and two, I think if you look at, if you uh, the kind world would be iconoclastic, the, the the more real world would be you know vicious, nasty politicians. Like if you look at the UK after a decade of Thatcherism, mm. it was a very different place from what it was before. Some might argue some things got better, um, but I think for the vast majority of people, things got worse. And yeah. so I think America after ten or twelve years of Trumpism will be unrecognisable. You know. <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, we, we we could go through this this all day. I mean, having lived there myself, I've I've seen where did things you starting to where emerge. Did you live, Steve? Oh, we were in Florida. All right. Oh, well. You can only imagine what it's like down there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, 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 there isn't even the veneer of civilization down there. I'm afraid. No, um, MAGA MAGA country, isn't it? Um, so yeah, uh, these were all kind of things I wanted to explore a bit in the novel. Ah, fair enough. Now, I mean, obviously, you've got it set in the backdrop of of this this, this apocalyptic Trump um, wasteland, but you, you you do have Frank killing off a number of people. Now, I guess we'll avoid spoilers by going by not going into the details of of exactly oh. who he kills. We you 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 set up the idea that he does. To what extent is that like a, a personal wish list? Um. <laughs> Well, uh, I try to think how to discuss this without spoilers. It's yeah, we'll not, be very, very careful. It's not, um, it's not personal for me. I'm not a very, um, uh, I can be politically very angry, but I'm not really a vengeful person. Um, right, too, okay. you know, Frank's carefully nurtured his grudges, whereas I tend yeah. to just, I, I don't have a long enough memory. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll forget him, man, at someday. But um, he, how to best put this? 
Well, you find out that the kind of a couple of the things that have happened after a decade of Trumpism is that the NRA, the gun lobby, is just out of control to the point where there's like mandatory open carry in a lot of yes. states. You have to have a you get arrested if you don't have a gun. I know that uh, was a glorious detail, <laughs> and it's led to policies like Rambo teachers where mm. schools employ teachers who get extra bonuses if they carry a gun in their arm, which leads to sort of five-way shootout massacres. And it's just the school shootings have got exponentially through the roof. And they've also, another thing they've they've done is a, a, abortions. Abortions been illegal for a few years now. Mm-hmm. And women are forced to resort to sort of backstreet abortions and right, crossing right. state lines. And uh, the abortion thing and the gun lobby thing have both wound up impacting on Frank's family. So right. I guess when I initially conceived the novel, it was meant to be a lot, um, maybe more broadly comedic. But sometimes when you start working on something, the the tone of the book gets set by certain fixed things. So once I knew Frank was going to kill a bunch of people, right. uh, I still wanted the reader, the reader had to have sympathy for Frank. Of because course. yeah, yeah, it couldn't just be like my friend Alan said. You know, somebody stole his parking space in 1984. So he's going yeah. to blow them away. It, it had to be something pretty big, uh, and that you would naturally be sympathetic towards. So that meant inventing this quite tragic backstory for Frank, and right, that right. ends up kind of dictating that the book was going to be quite an outright laugh fest. You know, right? Yeah, that that that, that happens sometimes. So it's, it's, it's probably closer to Cold Hands than Sunshine Cruise Company then, really, isn't it, to be fair? Uh, Cold Hands is an excellent reference point because that was a very similar process. Um, yeah. When I, when I had the idea for that book, as soon as I knew it was going to be about somebody who had killed a, a young boy when they were a kid, that immediately sort of sets the tone. You're not, you can't really come full comedy until... No. Uh, but that, also- but also another North American book. So are, are, are we sort of like separating our com- continents here? The the, the humour <laughs> happens in the, in Europe and the bad things happen over there. <laughs> um, I hadn't thought of that. Maybe, maybe. Well, to be fair, though, the next novel is, oh, hopefully, I think it is a lot funnier. And it's also set in America. Uh, uh, oh. Uh, I've, I've, just, I've just finished it, actually. So uh, uh, it will hopefully be published um, uh, end of next year, sort of autumn. 2021 um and it's uh, again it does go into trump territory um but hopefully the last uh, kill them all my, the sequel to kill your friends which came out in yeah. 2018 mm-hmm. was very much the backdrop to that novel was it was all set in 2017 and the right. backdrop was trump's inauguration and then yes. the first six months in office and so now obviously with the fuck it list is the book after kill them all it's also been uh, you know it's a trump backdrop booked and then the next one is called convenience and it's set in a sort of convenience station gas store and the gas station in the middle of nowhere in a sort of remote part of california okay. and uh, it all happens over the course of one night on election night 2016 oh, um, and it's a kind of comedy horror novel the idea was to kind of do a blend of kevin smith's clerks and uh, the john carpenter's the thing Right. So it's kind of uh, all set in this one quite intense location over the course of, of one night. Wow. So so we're certainly genre hopping here because because the Sunshine Cruise Company. I mean, I, I was trying to think how to describe it to someone the other day. The best I could come up with was um, Carry On Money Heist was about the best I could come up with. <laughs> that's not. Uh, that's, that's that's as fair as anything else. I think. Um, yeah. I sometimes. I mean, I think if I wrote in one straight genre i'd maybe be a bit more successful than i am because people kind of like to know what they get but I, yes yeah uh, you, you kind of can't help the way you're wired up and stories that, the stories that occur to you are the stories that occur to, to you uh, yeah. i don't know any other way to do it so i i, I fall in a sort of quite difficult position and i'm not a, i'm not a literary novelist you know right. um, and at the same time, I'm not a sort of populist genre novelist. I sort of fall yeah. between those two worlds, you know. But I've been lucky enough in that I've had enough of a readership. Now I've got enough readership that I'm 10 books in. And, you know, uh, as they say in the record industry, a successful album is the one that lets you make your next album. Right, so, right. Uh, we can, you know, uh, I'm not going to give J.K. Rowling any sleepless nights, but we, we do all right. And I feel lucky in that I get to do pretty much exactly what I want, you know. Yeah. Um, but I mean, at the same time, you don't want people saying, oh, look, John's written his book again. 
No, you don't want that, no. But I did think at one point, actually, after Cold Hands, that you mention it, I uh, had a bit of an idea for another thriller, and I had this fanciful plan that I was going to do a thriller series, and I'd do one year a sort of John Niven novel, and then next year yeah. I'd do a thriller novel and so on. But um, I just didn't quite have enough good thriller ideas to to keep that going, you know? But then you'd also have to do what J.K. Rowling has done in a Dr. Pseudonym, wouldn't you? So what would you be? Uh, <laughs> we, we, I thought about that too. We went round the houses on that, and I just couldn't come up with anything good. I, had a, I went for dinner with a dinner with Cat Moran, and I was saying, to her, "I've got to try and think of a pen name for these thrillers." And uh, at the end of the night, we we're both absolutely pissed. And I, I opened my my notepad the next day, and we must have written twenty. Have I got it in here? <laughs> We'd written about twenty ideas, and they were all absolutely, you know, they're all absolutely ludicrous. <laughs> Excellent. I, don't think, I don't think it's this notebook, unfortunately. Mm. Um, it's, like, it's like when bands make albums in the studio, there's always a sort of um, a lot of bands who have a, you know, a whiteboard up for album titles. Right, albums. yeah. And the joke, the joke half is always absolutely packed. And the, yeah. The series name's half is empty. Right, yeah. So it's a bit like that. So this, listen, since, since you mentioned music, I was going to ask you, because obviously that, that's kind of your, your background, isn't it? You were, you were in the music scene before you started writing. What are you listening to at the moment? Because we know you're not getting out much. What am I listening to at the moment? This moment because I'm I'm outlining a memoir that might be the next book I write. Okay, which, so this which, is the, so you're telling me that Kill Your Friends wasn't a memoir? <laughs> Sadly not. <laughs> um, a, a memoir that uh, which it, it kind of covers, but it's a story of me and my brother who. Um, killed himself 10 oh. years ago now um, sorry, sorry. Uh, no no that's, that's fine it's, it, well I say it's fine it's, it was very very sad but yeah. it's kind of about um, that question that I think haunts a lot of parents that you, you you bring two kids up and you think pretty much the same way and they go very different paths in life you know my brother yeah. kind of became a minor league drug dealer and then struggled with depression and became long term unemployed and it was a very sad story um but I, so I started. I am getting round to answer your question about music. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I've been outlining this. It's not going to be a misery memoir because there was a lot of fun stuff along the way too. And it's kind of about you know both our lives. Um, right. But the as part of doing that, I sort of I start in the seventies uh, when when we're small, and then obviously go right the way up till two thousand and ten when he when he commits suicide. Um, and so I've been listening to a lot of um, Spotify playlists from the specific years. So oh, every right. uh, well, also the other the other side effect of lockdown is I have my study in the house, and mm-hmm. normally that during the day it's very quiet. You know, the kids at school yeah. or Charlotte goes and does a thing, and but now of course we're all in the house all the time, so it's actually it can get quite noisy out in the sort of kitchen, the hall. You can just hear it a bit, but you know that way where you're trying to work in the house. Yeah. And so I don't normally write listening to music at all. A lot of writers mm-hmm. do. You know, mm-hmm. Ian Rankin does, Stephen King does. Uh, I've never been, a, I can't, I find it hard to listen to music while I write because I just get right, distracted. Right, yeah. But just in the past month or so, I've had to start doing it because it just right. blocks out the, the ambient noise of the house. Yeah. Um, so that's what I've been listening to. I've been listening to sort of, you know, um, UK chart hits from 1973 to 1980 has been my sort yeah. of listening for the past. Yeah, it's uh, <laughs> it's been interesting. You know, uh, a lot of stuff you um, you hear in those that God, I, I, I didn't remember that song. And uh, sometimes a song will jog a very specific memory. That sort of when you're writing something like memoir, it yeah. can be it can be very useful. But uh, in terms of new bands, what am I listening to? God. Oh, the last new band before all this happened that we really kind of get into went to see live a few with the the Lemon Twigs. I thought were really exciting. Lemon Twigs, mm, American band, very young. Okay, uh, that, this is going back two years now. Um, the debut album came out two, maybe even three. They were only seventeen and nineteen at the time, so they're very young. Um, but I like that record. Um, who else? Yeah. I mean, Would you have signed them? Would I, yes, I, de- I, I definitely would have, which is probably an absolute guarantee that they're never going to make it. <laughs> yeah, so, the, so they wouldn't, they're not going to be the next Coldplay then, obviously. I, I fear not, no. <laughs> does, does that come back to haunt you an awful lot? Do people tend to bring that up? Uh, 
I don't think I've ever done a reading in Germany or an interview where the conversation hasn't begun with reference to Coldplay and Muse. Um, oh well, I'm sorry to disappoint you. <laughs> no, it's it's all right. Uh, it, it does it haunt me? I want to be something when I think of the money. I probably right. <laughs> fist out on. But you know, other than that, no. <laughs> Fair enough. So, so I'm guessing with the lockdown going, the, the the golf game must be suffering a bit as well, yeah. Well, they just um, they've just lifted it in England. The ban on golf courses this week. Right. And um, so right. yeah, I, I'm technically I'm playing on Friday, but oh, that will that, that will be the first time since actually last November. Oh dear Lord. October. Well, the winter is so severe. Yeah, yeah I hate I, I hate playing in the rain and the cold. Yeah. So I um, I, I, normally we um, normally we get to oh sorry I tell a lie I played in LA in January. Right. Um, that was the last time. Um, so yeah, it'll be a good six five months when I get back. So it's quite a long layoff. I find sometimes uh, are you a golfer? I'm not. My I come from a golfing family, but I'm not right. personally. I find sometimes when you go back after a long layoff, you can actually play very well at first. Right. Because you're, you're quite uninhibited. You're not overthinking things, you know? Right, yeah. Um, normally my games, the, the golf season for me usually starts in April. And I'm normally mm-hmm. playing pretty well by May or June. And then it starts to go downhill <laughs> from there until October. And we stop again. Fair enough. So so, so where are you actually now? Because I mean, you mentioned earlier something about being back in Ayrshire. So clearly you're not you're not at home right now. Yeah, uh, I'm in uh, we're in Buckinghamshire now, so we're just outside of London. Just oh, very just, nice. Just west of London, but I, I I still have a home in Scotland. My right. well, my mum lives there, but we have a we still have a house in Ayrshire, so I, I visit I visit fairly regularly. Um, I still got a lot of friends in Glasgow, so right. I, I miss getting up there. I do. I, normally, it'd be quite rare that I wouldn't get to Scotland at least once every six or eight weeks. You know. Oh, fair enough. Uh, then. Uh, my mum's on her own, so she's missing the grandkids and stuff. So it's yeah, it's difficult on that level. That said, I think Scotland are doing the right thing and keeping their lockdown total. And obviously, yes. under Boris's ludicrous, flaky leadership, we're kind of neither here nor there. So it's, right. It's, yeah. Shooting. So, so, so there's an interesting bit of double thing going on there. So you, you, you're criticising the end of the lockdown and yet you're taking advantage of it by going and playing 18. Well, I never thought that... I, I, I believe that they only banned golf because I, Michael fucking Golf was asked in a TV interview on the spot, well, right. well we close golf courses and he went, uh, yeah. Right. Literally, uh, if you thought about it, there's no need to. Golf, you can comfortably maintain... It's, it's the most socially distant sport there is. There are, especially if you're bad, you spray your ball all over the course. <laughs> but also, I, I mean, if you, you know, if, as long as you don't putt out, so you don't have to put your hand in the hole, you don't touch right, yeah. the flag stick, you just play a gimme game, so, you know, you get it within right. two feet and it's fine, pick it up. Then you, you don't need to touch anything, you know. You don't, I wouldn't ride in a cart, I wouldn't hire a cart that people had been right. in and out of. But if, if you go and you walk, uh, you know, even maybe playing four balls would be difficult, but if you play a two ball, it's easy to, you know. So I never thought that that was a, a sound thing to shut the courses anyway. So that's my get out there. <laughs> that, 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 that's how you justify it to yourself. Correct. Fair enough. Fair enough. So, so, you, so we've already established that you're, you're less than enamoured of the American leadership during the lockdown then. What are we making of the British like, leadership? Let's just do that quickly. Just, oh, just as bad. Uh, to, uh, I think Stur- Nicola Sturgeon is a very good leader and has been very clear in this from the off, you know? Yeah. Whereas uh, Johnson, like Trump, I mean, they would, they, would, they would take a doubling of the death rate just to try and save the economy. But no, that's again, it's a fallacy in itself. We, we have plenty of money. We can help people through this. The, 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 our costs in this so far are somewhere north of 100 billion. You know, the banks got right. 500, they got, got yeah. five times that back in 2008 without the bat of an eyelid, you know. Um, yeah. So we know we can get through this for another six months if we need to. Um, yeah. Uh, it's just a question of do you want to do it and and also don't forget a lot of the problems we're having and the reason it's getting so expensive is we didn't do it quickly enough well that's we true lockdown yeah. weeks. We, were, we, we were living a kind of lockdown lifestyle two weeks before it was actually right. called you know Yeah. Um, and I know that's easy for me to say we have quite a big house we've got a big garden and um, you know we like cooking and also from Purely from a selfish perspective, my daily routine didn't change that much. 
you know, I, I get up in the morning, I come in my study, I put her about and, you know, miss kind of going to restaurants or yeah. going for coffee or what have you. But it wasn't really a huge shock to our system the way we yeah. live now, you know. So when yeah. you're told to work from home, you're going, OK. Yeah, I, I, I can do that, you know, I'm, I'm yeah. used to that. But I think for some people who are used to where you maybe kids in school or in childcare and two parents out working, I mean, suddenly you're all in the house together uh, right. 24-7, you know. I think some people are finding that very difficult. No, fair enough. Now, listen, since, since you've mentioned Nicola Sturgeon, um, it, it would be remiss of me. I'm sure you get this a lot of the time. But given you are, at the very least, semi-professionally Scottish, where are we standing at the moment on the issue of um, independence? Well, I've always been pro Scottish independence uh, mm-hmm. and and also very pro EU. So my ideal position was an independent Scotland as part of the EU. I was right, uh, and of course Brexiteers will always come at you and say, "Well, how can you how can you be for Scottish independence, but you don't want us to? You still want to be part of the EU." And yeah. I'm a, I'm a federalist, I'm internationalist, and my right, yeah. view with Scotland was um. Ever since I was a, ever since I've been born, Scotland has never ever voted for a Tory government, and yet it's got one every single yeah. time. So to me, right. Scotland, Scottish people have a completely different outlook uh, on on life, on politics, yeah. and have the right to self determination. Um, and uh, as well as the whole Brexit movement was just this thundering, horrific wave of the worst kind of nationalism and, and patriotism. Um, which I want no part of. Whereas right. I think the, the EU, um, it, it's just such a, a dismal day we voted to, to leave the EU. So that, I, I campaigned quite hard for Scottish independence. And looking back now, that was the first blow, really. I remember losing the independence vote, but the first blow that was then very quickly followed by um, tr- uh, Brexit and then Trump. And then yeah, they, they were back to back, really, weren't they? Pretty yeah, much. Yeah, they were. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it was like four hammer blows in a row, you know. Um, yeah. That just gave you this awful sense that the world was creeping a bit to the, you know, creeping further and further to the right. Yeah. So, do you see yourself moving back to Scotland? Uh, I I could, but I don't think it'll be for a few years. Um, just just for the kids, you know. Right. I think once the kids have all flown, yeah, I could. But that said, we're up there a lot anyway, you know. Right, yeah, fair um, enough. So it's not that I don't get to see it. But, yeah, I, well, I, I did sort of say that, you know, if we end up doing this huge act of national self-harm, which is a no-deal Brexit, off the back of having come through coronavirus, yeah, I think things might get so grim in England that I might yeah. be happy to. I might... Um, I might force the case and say, right, we're going back to Scotland. I've had enough of this. That sounds sounds absolutely reasonable. <laughs> Where were you from originally, Steve? Salford. All oh, right. Oh, great. Good, good. Uh, my son yeah. went to. I know. I know Manchester isn't the same as Salford, but my son no, went. No, not. To, uh, yeah. I, my son went to university in Manchester, so. And, uh, right. Uh, it's I, I it's close myself. enough. Yeah, yeah. Close enough, but I, I escaped in '91. All oh, right. Uh, and I, I, I do get back and I recognise an awful lot of what, of what you, you're talking about. Um, you, you, you left at the height of Manchester. <laughs> I, mate, I, I, the stories I could tell you of, of how I missed out on Manchester, you wouldn't believe. <laughs> I, I'd been in the US until um, sort of like mid-89 mid, mid 89 and I came back and I remember sitting in St. Anne's Square in Manchester seeing everyone with these T-shirts on advertising a band called the Stone Roses. I'm thinking, I must find out about them. They sound awfully good. <laughs> and I went home and the, my brother had the tape and I had a listen and then I thought, well, that changes everything, doesn't it? <laughs> so, yeah, it was it was a good time to be in Manchester. It really was. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what, John, we've covered an awful lot of ground this morning. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. No, my, my pleasure, Steve. Thank you for having me. Um... And, uh, and just to remind us, the next book is, the current book is called The Fuck It List. It's out now. It is. It is indeed. Uh, it's out, uh, in hardback paperback uh, just before the US election in October fair enough good timing um, and it's and it's on Kindle as well isn't it as it is Kindle Audible all mm. many many platforms one way or other you can track it down and and I'm going to claim this is a massive scoop for Crave Convenience is going to be your next book and that's going to come out uh, next I year I think autumn 2021 fantastic well thanks very much
Okay, well, thank you for having me, Steve. And uh, good, luck, uh, good luck. Thanks. 